morning. I'm happy that this many people showed up to this event, this important event. So I'm going to talk about some of the disasters that I've covered, my experience, my background. We'll have some questions afterwards. Um, right now, as our global society, you're probably aware that we are completely unprepared for climate change and the disasters of the future. My name is Alex Londos. I own the International Disaster Relief Company. It's called Advanced Disaster Relief. I started this company a, a few years ago after being a journalist for a few decades, covering different disasters around the world. When I was 25 years old, I watched the news when Hurricane Katrina was being affected. When Hurricane Katrina affected the New Orleans area, I felt deep anxiety and emotional discomfort. I wanted to be a part of the solution. I wanted to help, but I felt helpless. That's when I packed my vehicle uh, with supplies and equipment, and I drove from Santa Cruz 2,300 miles to New Orleans. I was able to pass out food and bottled water and supplies to people that have been affected by Hurricane Katrina before the multinational organizations and the military arrived. I felt empowered, and I wanted to continue to help make a difference. I also felt that we don't have the we can't always be dependent on the government. We can't always be dependent on others. So that's when I continued to put myself through college, to Cabrillo College. I continued to take more classes in environmental science, uh, climatology, as well as survival. In that moment, when I was in Katrina, I realized that we had to be a part of the solution. With my training and education, I studied journalism, emergency medical response, fire technology, environmental science, meteorology, geology, and a lot of first responder courses. I took renewable energy resources and solar technology. I also completed all of the Red Cross courses. I took the emergency response courses at the Felton Fire Station called CERT, it stands for Community Emergency Response Teams course. I'd recommend it, they have them at the Felton Fire Station. I also took the EMT course. Throughout my missions, I've now documented different disasters and provided immediate uh, medical aid in critical areas around the world. I've self-deployed to hazmat cleanups, lightning storms, wildfires, floods, blizzards, landslides, sinkholes, and snowstorms. I sometimes attach myself as a single resource in different disaster areas, or I recruit my own volunteers and we work on our independent uh, missions and objectives in different places and different disasters. So I've now done search and rescue, body recovery, uh, psychological debriefing, risk mitigation, debris removal, I've helped rebuild infrastructures, and I've volunteered in several hospitals. Uh, can we please hit play on the video, and it'll go through some of my additional slides. Thank you. So as a global society, let's see. So I've personally been through six hurricanes. The most recent uh, hurricane was Hurricane Michael when it affected Panama City. I've covered the aftermath of four other hurricanes. Uh, some of the major ones are Hurricane Katrina, Supers, Typhoon, Haiyan that affected the Philippines, and Hurricane Maria that hit Puerto Rico. I was in Puerto Rico for two months, beginning 12 days after that storm on a remote island called Viegas. I was in Ghana during the peak of the Ebola outbreak, and a few years ago I went to Iraq on my own humanitarian mission. I was volunteering in Nepal after the earthquake, and throughout all these missions, I've had the wonderful opportunity to work alongside professionals, uh, world leaders, military personnel. I've had the opportunity to fly in military aircraft, helicopters, rode on military convoys. I love working with aid organizations and people making a difference. I love being able to figure out the solutions to a series of uh, continuous problems. I like completing my mission objectives and uh, feeling accomplished and successful. After these missions, I know what it's like to see people malnutrition, begging for water, or fighting for food. I've seen sick people, people injured without medicine and immediate medical help. I've seen people walking through polluted water, searching through debris, and their destroyed home looking for family members. I know what it's like to speak with and work through psychologically devastated people who just lost everything. I want you to take this moment and I want you to imagine what it would be like if you lost everything. If you were injured and hungry, if you were dirty and cold, if you were scared and everything was dangerous around you, if you were in the middle of complete chaos and you had no one to turn to, no one for help and no one came to help you for, for days if not weeks, and that's what our future is going to soon be like. I've covered disasters 
around the world, and I've never been to a disaster where there was enough help, there was never enough resources for humanitarian aid, uh, there's just never enough supplies for people. People are always left suffering, struggling, and trying to survive. Throughout my career, my main goal has been to help animals, people, and the environment. And this time in my life, it continue, continually angers me that there is nothing that I'm going to be able to do to help my family and the people that I love the most against the climate change-related threats that are posing risks to our entire society. I won't be able to help my friends, the people that I've ever met, and all the people that I care about. I'm concerned about all of you, everybody in this audience and everybody on this earth, all of the future generations and the, all the animal species. We're in a really dangerous and pivotal moment in time, as you know. In this moment, we're all a witness to the rap, uh, rapid and alterations in the planet's atmosphere, species extinction, ecologically, uh, ecological systems are collapsing at exponential rates, we're seeing positive feedback loops happening, and they're happening much faster than the general public is aware. Most people don't even know how bad things are, and if you spend too much time on the internet and research and all of this, you're definitely going to be extremely scared. So we're now facing the super storms and thousand year floods that scientists predicted decades ago. These are the colder winters, the deadly heat waves mega droughts, and uncontrollable forest fires. We knew that these would happen if we didn't divest from the fossil fuel. In the near future, we will begin seeing simultaneously occurring superstorms. They will increase in frequency and severity, and we are not prepared. We will see more civil unrest, mass hysteria, and widespread suffering. Unfortunately, the women, the children, the elderly, the weak, the injured, the ill, will be most affected. The people that are unprepared for these disasters will be the most affected. This is the reality that we have created. This is the reality that we have created and we are not prepared. We are not prepared locally and we are not prepared globally. International disaster funding will be enormous. It will be massive. Much higher than anticipated. Resources will become scarce. Therefore, a collaborated international effort will be Mandatory. We will have to start working with other countries and helping out other countries in the future. Once the scope of the disaster is so severe, we will need international support. Uh, disasters will soon overwhelm local and regional resources and we will be dependent on other, other sources around the world. We need the international community and those working in emergency services to reevaluate existing proce procedures, adjust response management protocols, and improve resource mobilization systems while continually training for the disasters of the future. We must independently establish, define objectives, and invest more attention towards emergency planning, risk mitigation, and preparedness. That includes some of you possibly taking the Red Cross courses, taking the Community Emergency Response Teams course, and the CERT course, taking all the training classes that you can on the FEMA website, Please understand the urgency of this. Become educated and vigilant and adapt quickly. Thank you for listening to my presentation. And as I watch the news in New Orleans uh, affecting the people in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, it was those journalists that uh, motivated me and inspired me to get out and make a difference. So I hope some of my images and what you saw up here helps motivate and inspire you to take the training classes and the steps necessary. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you, and I would like to leave a few minutes for questions and answers for Alex, and I would like to get the lights back on. Or are these pictures still going? Yeah, okay, after the pictures, I guess. So, anybody have a specific question for Alex or anything they want to say at this time? Yes, no, you don't get off that quick, get over here. You just, you just landed people in a really deep place, so you've got to give them an extra breath, and then maybe some people will raise their hands, and we'll be okay. Uh, way to go, buddy. Yeah, yeah. How did you make an agreement with the government of the United States to, to give you the aid that you needed to deliver that when you were trying to do this outreach? I don't wait for the government. But I saw you with all of that U.S. aid package. Uh, that was in the Philippines after Super uh, Typhoon Haiyan. Local name was Yolanda, and I was working with the U.S. military and other aid organizations. Um, the Malaysian military was there. The Philippine 
Filipino military. Us. I flew on a lot of helicopters, military aircraft, went on ride-alongs. They were a lot more open. There's less red tape. Uh, the U.S. just slows down potential progress, as we saw in Puerto Rico, um, Florence, and all these other disasters. So. so how do you support yourself and pay for the aid that you provide? Uh, through different donations and volunteers, but usually I go with enough stuff to supply myself and hold me over until additional help and resources arrives. Depending on how much I'm able to bring in, that's when I attach myself as a single resource with other aid organizations that are in the region, or they give me different types of aid that I distribute on my own and I report back and then pick up additional supplies. It kind of, actually, when I was in Puerto Rico after the superstorm, I was in Puerto Rico on a small island called Viegas. It was the most affected island uh, in Puerto Rico. And I was there for a really long duration of time. We weren't getting supplies and aid, and what we did get was protein bars and snacks and candy from FEMA. It was ridiculous. So there was uh, different uh, family members and friends that were sending me packages uh, via uh, FedEx and USPS through the mail, and then I was distributing. Yes, if I'm recalling correctly, Viegas is an island that was used as a uh, uh, bomb shelling uh, center. Yes, correct. So half of the island is inhabited, and the other half was the bomb shelling, and it's off limits. Okay, so uh, my question then, because I did not realize that it was also an inhabited half of Viegas. Oh, yes. Um, Population of approximately 10,000 people. So uh, are you aware of there being any differences between the experiences of Viegas versus the more populated islands? Uh, yes, it was extremely difficult to get out there. When I first landed in, on the island of Puerto Rico, I went to, I brought all, all the supplies and medical equipment that I was given by Philip Merkin, which uh, owns a nonprofit and does stuff with Fiji. So I went to the hospital, I asked them what the most affected area was, and they said, please get to the island of Vegas and check on their family members and friends. So I uh, recruited a few volunteers, uh, hitchhiked to ride all the way to the port, and I got on one of the ferries. I was the first person in Vegas. Uh, treating medical patients, providing aid and resources at that time. That was approximately 13 days after the hurricane. And that was the most affected area, that was right where the eye went over that region. Did that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Yes. How do you feel about uh, collective direct action? This presentation was more to show about um, the potential dangers, the risks, and what I've experienced, but I'm not giving up, I'm still trying to eat organic all the time. I haven't owned and driven a car for six years. I'm still um, promoting solar and every other form of reducing our carbon footprints, if that's what you're um, asking. I'm still, is, is that your question? Direct action and just collectively working on solutions? No. <laughs> that's how I interpret it, because I'm not giving up. There's a lot of disasters going on, but I'm still trying. We'll, we'll get to that. that. Okay, okay, we'll get to that. Sorry, I'm unfamiliar with the terminology. Uh, I have the website at advanceddisasterrelief.com, and my name is on the flyers out in the lobby as well. It's Alex Londos. You're welcome to get one of those flyers and stay there. I'll be around after, but my Facebook is the, the number one place that I connect with people, um, uh, network, and communicate. Facebook, via Facebook. Any additional questions? One more. There. Yes. Hey, yeah, I'm just wondering, given your experience, what impacts do you anticipate locally here in this area that maybe we're not thinking about based yeah. on your experience we could anticipate? I, I don't want to go too much into de detail regarding this because I feel Guy McPherson may take that over and specifically pinpoint some of those. I would say uh, forest fires. I've covered, I didn't show on here, but I've covered approximately 30 to 40 forest fires throughout my career. Every major oh. one you can think of, I've covered. I just returned back from five months in 11 European countries before the, um, the uh, campfire, so I didn't cover that one. But I, I would think uh, practicing def defensible space is really important, and I don't see that enough. And I think it's always good to be prepared to have a bug out bag and be ready for earthquakes. And the long term is the rise in ocean sea level and severe yes. storms with down power lines and you know different storm related disasters. But especially in the mountains where the winds are higher. So. Amen. Awesome. One more hand for Alex Londos. We'll be around afterwards. Thank you, Alex. So here we go, rite of passage, next stage. Uh, put your hands together, Dr. Guy McPherson. Thanks to Tom in the back, who ensures that we have slides showing on the screen. You'd be amazed at how infrequently this happens when I'm on tour. 
Here we are, 2019, and we can't get a slide to appear on the screen. Thanks to Julia, who fed me lunch today, and also my partner, Pauline, who's there behind the camera. So thank you, Pauline. And thanks especially to all of you for making the trip today. This is pretty heavy stuff, and I don't want to talk about it. So maybe we'll be all better off if we just leave right now. No, seriously, I don't want to talk about it. I've been talking about it for a long time, and it hasn't fixed a thing. It's like Mark Twain said about the weather. Everybody talks about it, and nobody does anything about it. It's the same with climate. I've been talking about it for a long time. It hasn't improved my life at all, I can assure you. The defamation, libel, and slander that continue to this day. Let me check. Can I get an email? Yep. Another one. Anyway. Thank you for coming, and I just wanted to make it clear that this is not my favorite topic in the world. This is my least favorite topic in the world. So, at least we're all together on that. I'm going to talk about planetary hospice, and it's going to take me longer than 20 minutes. Well, I say that, and you come sneaking up behind me and trying to trip me. Unplug it. I'm trying to press the button. Hit you with the jello. Stephen Jenkinson has been in what he calls the death trade his entire adult life. I think this is a great line. He has dealt with hospice for his entire adult life. He has dealt with what goes on in hospice for his entire adult life. And he correctly points out that hope is the four-letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. I try to be more clear and more pointed about that. In an essay I wrote recently, I said, hope is a mistake and a lie. After all, hope, according to my buddies Miriam and Webster, is to want something to happen or to be true. That's our hope. We want something to happen. We wish for something to happen. That's it. That's all there is to hope. With fear, we project into the future that we cannot predict with accuracy, and we say it's going to be awful. And with hope, we project into the future, which we cannot know with accuracy, and we say it's going to be awesome. Imagine, if you will, that it's 1940, 1941, 1942 in the United States, and people hoped. Imagine people hoping that we wouldn't get drawn into World War II. Imagine people hoping that we wouldn't be able to ensure a positive outcome. If we had taken the hope route as a country, I suspect we'd all be speaking German now. Instead, we were feared into action. I don't promote Fear, either. I think hope and fear are the four-letter words that are on the opposite side of the I don't know the future coin. But if you're looking for action, fear works a heck of a lot better than hope does. The Grief Recovery Institute uses my favorite definition of grief, and that is wishing for a different past. We don't grieve if we complete a relationship with somebody before they leave. We don't grieve if that very important person in our life dies and we were able to talk with them for the previous six months knowing they were going to die. So we managed to complete that relationship. We managed to say, I love you and I'm going to miss you. We managed to say, I forgive you for what you've done. We managed to say, please forgive me for what I've done. We've managed to say, I'm sorry, and I love you, and we got all those things done, and then the person dies, and we've completed that relationship, so we don't wish for that different past. Mostly, and there's more to it than this, obviously, there's more nuance to be had here, but Peter wants me done 10 minutes ago. Mostly, we grieve because we didn't fully complete that relationship. Mostly we grieve because we were wishing for a different past. We wish things had gone differently. So if hope is wishing for a different future and hope is and, and grief is wishing for a different past, it doesn't seem like either of those is a particularly safe route to go. With respect to planetary hospice, there's a 
a wonderful, amazing paper by this incredible guy that appeared in Clinical Psychology Forum. I'm putting on my time machine hat here. It appeared about two weeks ago, a couple of weeks before the May publication date in the peer-reviewed journal Clinical Psychology Forum. And the paper points out that belief in a positive future or hope is not useful when presenting a person with a terminal diagnosis. Instead, instead of hoping, which is the American way, this paper draws parallels between what happened with the medical community, physicians and medical ethicists, in the 1960s and early 1970s, and compares that to today, and particularly today's climate scientists and government entities, as well as the corporate media. Back in the 60s and 70s, medical doctors routinely, do routinely lied to their patients in the name of hope. Hope was viewed as such an important idea that hope was promulgated even at the expense of telling a lie to the patient. It's okay. And we see that today with the corporate media, with the governments of the world, and with most, clim most climate scientists. Because hope is more important, apparently, than telling the truth. Oh, I should admit that I wrote this paper and that it was re reviewed, reviewed by peers. I knew nothing about the clinical psychology literature. And so this was quite a journey for me when the editor who had been following my work asked me to write a paper, sent it out for peer review. The peer reviewer said, no, you got this wrong, you got this wrong. The paper was revised back and forth a few times. And then it appeared a couple of weeks ago. So what I'm going to talk about with respect to hospice and with respect to completing relationships in our lives, I'm going to talk about anticipatory grief at scale. We anticipate grief when we know somebody is going to die or we know they're going to leave. We know it's going to be our last day at work, for example, and we're, never going to, we're rarely going to see our coworkers again. If our work is important to us, if we derive great joy from going to work, then we might grieve the loss of those relationships, the breaking up, if you will. At scale, here I'm thinking about things like 9-11, or a more trenchant and larger scale example, six million Jews during World War II. That's the scale I'm talking about. How do we scale up? from palliative end-of-life care for individuals and make this about all of society, or at least about our community, or at least about our family? I don't know. If you see something, should you say something? I don't know. I used to tell everybody I'd know. I'd be walking down the street, happy as can be. Somebody would say hello. I would assume that was an invitation to talk about near-term human extinction. <laughs> Sometimes, oddly, that didn't go very well. <laughs> you know the people in your life better than I do. You should, you should know whether to raise the most important topic in the history of humanity. Should you? Shouldn't you? I don't know about your relationships. But you might ask. So I, I started doing this lately, except when I'm invited to speak. Now when I sit next to somebody on the airplane and they're trapped in the window seat and I have the aisle seat, I don't just assume that they want to know that their grandchildren are going to die soon. I don't make that assumption anymore. I used to. It was insane. I never really had any social skills. This is commonplace with scientists, by the way. You probably noticed. So I just launched into the conversation. Now I ask the question, if there's an asteroid that's going to strike Earth and we know with great certainty when it's going to hit, and therefore when we're going to lose habitat for humans, do you want to know? And most people say, yeah, yeah, sure, I want to know. And other people say no, and then I just stop right there. No, I really do. I stop right there. I don't drag them through the muck. They love their lives. They don't want to know their expiration date. And I'm not saying that I know your expiration date, by the way. In any event, if you don't want to know, now would be a good time to leave. 
And there's no shame in leaving, really. And I'm not going to tell you when you're going to die anyway. So there's a little bit of mystery here. But I'm going to tell you that it's going to be faster than you're being told by almost everybody else. It's not as if this is the first time our only planet has had a mass extinction event. By definition, mass extinction events take out at least 50% of the species that occur on the planet. And so you see here some examples, all within the last 500 million years, because that's all the good records we have. And the worst of these is the third one, the end Permian event, some 252 million years ago, which eliminated more than 90% of the species on the planet. That was due to abrupt heating. The current version, the sixth mass extinction, is also due to abrupt heating. And the heating in this case is occurring about 10 times faster than it did during the end Permian event. In part because we're pouring greenhouse gases into the atmosphere in order of magnitude faster than occurred during the end Permian event. So it shouldn't be a surprise that this particular extinction event is occurring much more rapidly than the previous ones. According to a paper just out within the last couple of weeks, it takes at least 10 million years to recover from a mass extinction event. We are in the sixth mass extinction as concluded even by the very conservative peer-reviewed journal literature. Initially, in a paper written, published in 2015 by Sabios and colleagues, the subtitle of this paper is the important part, entering the sixth mass extinction, because everything before the colon is completely confusing. Accelerated modern human-induced species losses. R2D2 could have said that. It would have been more understandable. By 2017, a couple of years later, a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, same senior author, same second author, Paul Ehrlich, author of The Population Bomb. Biological annihilation. That's a little more clear, isn't it? That's not confusing at all. Biological annihilation. This is not the National Enquirer. This is the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Biological annihilation. So we're into the sixth mass extinction, as Paul Ehrlich says, we're toxifying the entire planet. I'm going to talk mostly today about functional extinction, not about when the last individual of our species dies. Because when I do that, people think, one, I'm crazy, and I'm not ruling that out, by the way, and two, that they're going to be that person. <laughs> right? If I say the last human being goes extinct in 2035, then everybody in the audience goes, oh, on December 31st, 2024, things are going to get really bad. Things are already really bad. So I'm going to talk about functional extinction, which comes by two different pathways. Total reproductive failure, there's just not enough organisms left to reproduce. Conservation biologists call this the minimum viable population size. No kidding, people actually use terms like that. I'll give an example. Loss of habitat is the other means. This is a paper that was just out a week ago. A, a synthetic paper published by the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System indicating that an increase of one and a half degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline is the maximum the planet can tolerate. At worst, it will lead to extinction of humankind altogether. So at one and a half degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline, we could trigger events that lead to our own demise. Awkwardly, more than two years ago, we were at one and three quarters degrees above the 1750 baseline, a fact very few scientists will admit to. So it could be that we will continue to experience the slow motion train wreck of human extinction, what Peter called the climate roulette, that people will continue to die, that people will continue to lose habitat in specific areas and that it will go global. It could be that that's already underway. Or maybe it'll occur more abruptly 
as a result of a handful of phenomena that I'm going to talk about shortly. So I mentioned two means to functional extinction. One is total reproductive failure. Here is the last male white rhino at a conservatory in Africa and it is being consoled by a worker there. It's the last male of the species and it subsequently died. With only two female individuals remaining of the white rhino, we can comfortably call it functionally extinct. The minimum viable population size passed long ago. According to the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases, writing in October of 1990, one degree C is the absolute upper limit above the 1750 baseline that we can heat the planet without triggering self-reinforcing feedback loops, what they called rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses that could lead to extensive ecosystem damage. The United Nations knew at the time that we depend upon ecosystems for our own survival and that by destroying those ecosystems, we risk runaway climate change. Briefly, seven means by which we could reach functional extinction, loss of habitat for human beings on Earth, if we haven't already lost habitat for humans on Earth. The first of those reported in the literature was a 50 gigaton burst of methane reported by Natalia Shikova and colleagues at the European Ge Geophysical Union meetings in 2008. And they indicated that a release of up to 50 gigatons of methane, hydrate, hy is highly possible for a breath release at any time. That would warm the planet significantly in a very short period of time. And at this point, it's all about rate. The rate of change with respect to the environment is what really matters for our species and every other one on the planet. Very slow rates of change give us an opportunity to keep up, to adapt. We can even experience genetic change that allows us to keep up with those slow rates of change, if they're slow enough. Shikova and colleagues were routinely disparaged for this paper for years. And then finally, nearly a dozen authors from another research program concluded that, in the, again, in the peer-reviewed literature, there were distinct episodes of methane release in the past, and therefore we can expect that kind of thing to happen in the future. Shikova and colleagues with her research team of approximately a dozen people, completely independent of the Sarav team, concludes the same thing in a paper in Nature Communications. And then another member of Shikova's team, Wild, who's a senior author on a third paper in Crowdsphere Discussions, indicating that an abrupt release of methane is actually highly likely at any time. So there is affirmation now in the peer-reviewed literature for a phenomenon that this research team had been talking about for a long time. So that's the first that was reported in the literature. The second of those is methane released from, from terrestrial permafrost, not from the relatively shallow seabed of the Arctic Ocean where the methane is lying there lurking like a monster in wait, but instead from the land-based permafrost, which contains a lot of methane that is released when the, methane, when the permafrost decomposes. And so here's a paper from Geosciences late last year measuring methane released at more than 8,500 parts per million. This is important. Methane in the atmosphere is typically measured in parts per billion. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there were about 750 parts per billion of methane in the atmosphere. And now there's well over 2,500 parts per billion and measurements in this particular research study indicate eight and a half million parts per billion. That's staggering. How fitting the research is conducted in Yamal in Russia. Yamal literally translated means the end of the world. Obviously, continued industrial activity will continue to heat the planet. This is an idea 
first written about by Tim Garrett in the Atmospheric Sciences Program at the University of Utah, now the, the head of the Atmospheric, Atmospheric Sciences Program. And he points out that it doesn't really matter how we power industrial civilization with solar panels or wind turbines or wave power or whatever we're going to throw at it, it still heats the planet. Civilization is a heat engine. How badly is civilization a heat engine? From, people, from a paper late last year, our study suggests that climates like those of the Pliocene will prevail as soon as 2030 and persist under current climate scenarios. What does Pliocene mean? That's two to three degrees Celsius higher than we are right now. In about a decade. That is so fast that I doubt very many species on the planet can keep up. So when we say civilization is a heat engine, that's the kind of speed we're talking about. On the other hand, decreased industrial activity also heats the planet. Wait, what? This is a phenomenon that has now been relatively widely written about, but never by the corporate media. It's relatively frequently talked about, but never by anybody from government. At the same time that industrial activity produces greenhouse gases, which act as a blanket and hold the heat close to the earth, at the same time that happens, industrial activity is also producing aerosols that go into the atmosphere and block incoming sunlight from getting in to warm the planet to begin with. First paper on this was by James Hansen and colleagues, published in December 2011. A subsequent paper indicates that as little as a 35% reduction will cause a one degree Celsius global average temperature rise. How fast? Hansen said in an interview about a year after that first paper came out, December 2012, it was released on YouTube in January of 2013, he says that it takes five days. Five days after the reduction in industrial activity occurs, the planet heats up. That's catastrophically fast. Most other climate scientists now concur that this speed will be about six weeks. Five days, six weeks, that's both less than a growing season. That's way faster than any tree on the planet can keep up. So this is a very, very rapid rate of change. Confirmed by a paper in the February 8th, 2019 issue of Science, in which the cooling effect was much larger than the previous estimates. In fact, we've, we've underestimated what's going on. And the senior author, Rosenfeld, concluded in an interview that this points to a greater amount of warming than we previously thought. How many times have we heard that from the climate science literature? The most common phrase I'm aware of when people are writing about or talking about climate change, faster than expected. So it could be that a financial collapse. I will. Yes, I not only can, I will. Why are you switching back and forth in this most recent point I, you're I'm, I'm going to give, 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 it can just be as low as 35% reduction. So here's how that works. At the same time industrial, like we're all familiar with greenhouse gases and how they trap heat because that's all we ever hear about. In fact, the common response is we need to reduce emissions. We need to switch to electric cars, thereby burning coal instead of oil. We need to reduce emissions if we have any hope at all. Unfortunately, at the same time that industrial activity, meaning burning fossil fuels, produces those greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide and water vapor and methane, that serve as blankets to heat up the planet. At the same time that's going on, every time we turn on a light switch, we emit aerosols that go up into the atmosphere and serve as an umbrella and provide what's called the aerosol masking effect, or global dimming. So you burn a lump of coal, 
You're a bad person, everybody knows that. Burning coal makes you a bad person because it produces carbon dioxide. Well, it also produces sulfates, and the worse the coal, the better for producing sulfates. Unclean coal, the customary version of coal, has more sulfur in it than clean coal. Clean coal is largely devoid of sulfur. When you burn a sulfur-rich junk chunk of coal, you produce sulfates. Sulfates are the leading aerosols that go up there and form that umbrella. So, inconveniently enough, continuing to burn fossil fuels increases the heating of the planet. So much so that by 2030 we're in the Pliocene. Not burning fossil fuels, reducing fossil fuels as little as 35% or so, reducing industrial output by 35% or so, which is not that much, causes the temperature to rise even faster. Doomed if you do, doomed if you don't. Do you want me to go over that again? So, we produce these aerosols by burning fossil fuels. And these aerosols float up into the atmosphere and serve as an umbrella, protecting us from further heating. And they're constantly falling out of the sky. Every minute, every day, aerosols falling out of the sky. If we don't keep putting them up there, they'll all fall out soon. So what that means is we have to keep putting the aerosols up in the sky. The only way we know how to do that is to burn fossil fuels. If you're doing the Scooby thing right now, rut row, I can understand. So, of course, we all know about greenhouse gases that result from industrial activity. And now we also know about these aerosols that are produced by industrial activity. So we're doing two things at once, one is good, one is bad. If we could separate them, we'd be golden. But we don't know how to do that. Question from the way in the back? Yes. Uh, this is uh, probably coming from an intoxicated folk, but it's a question. Uh, let's assume, if I follow you correctly, that with the 35% uh, reduction, that we lose our aerosol masking effect and aggravate the situation, uh, even though we have not created as much warming below, we have been also getting more warming from above. Now, my question... More sunlight is coming through. More sunlight is coming through. Now, however, let's assume, whatever the probability, but just as the, to get the concept right, that we decrease it not only 35%, but we decrease it a total of 70%. Is that a situation, under your understanding, that could possibly, we've all, perhaps have we lost our aerosol masking effect to the first 35%? We've, we've reduced it. We've reduced it. Basically, we've punched a bunch of holes in our umbrella yeah. by reducing it 35%. If, if we reduce it 70%, we punch a bunch more holes in the umbrella. And my question is, is it twice as many holes to the 70% or have we done most of the damage to the aerosol masking effect to the first volley of reduction so that by the second volley of industrial reduction, we may be able to gain some reduction in the global warming without a correspondingly proportionate gain in the loss of the aerosol masking effect? That's asking the question, not as a, not as a counter or a statement that uh, your position is wrong, but rather as a I understand. Uh, so are the two effects necessarily in proportion to one another? It's, it's worse than I've told you. The aerosol masking effect is reduced or lost in somewhere between five days and six weeks. The greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere ensure heating for at least the next thousand years. So we can reduce emissions today. Let's just say today, we, we don't believe the aerosol masking effect. We don't believe the evidence underlying the aerosol masking effect. 
So we decided today we're going to stop emitting fossil fuels. We're going to stop emitting carbon dioxide. Well, the carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere locks us into the heating associated with 412 parts per million carbon dioxide for at least the next thousand years. And that's well over six degrees Celsius global average temperature rise. So not only is it this paradox where we're doing a good thing and a bad thing at the same time, but they don't balance out. The, the aerosol masking effect is rapid and the reduction of carbon dioxide and the heating associated with that is very, very slow. Yeah. Based on the evidence I've seen, including massive synthetic works by the United States National Academy of Sciences in 2015 and by a European body of similar stature in 2015, geoengineering will make the situation worse, not better. I'm going to move on. I can refer you to it later to those publications. Basically, We've been geoengineering since we first stuck a shovel in the ground. And that's, that releases carbon dioxide and methane. And if we continue to geoengineer by any means that we know about so far, it will make the situation worse, not better. We don't do very well. Yes? There is no known means to accomplish that. I would like to believe otherwise, and I'm going to move on now. We'll have we'll, plenty we'll of more time questions time. later. Thank you. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. It's almost like we have the teamed up. <laughs> okay. Item number five that could produce functional extinction is decline in grain harvest as a result, for example, of the 83% loss in earthworms in intensively plowed areas compared to adjacent areas, as reported in a paper last year in Soil Systems. Or maybe we'll have a decline in the grain harvest because there's a land hurricane striking the Midwestern United States. Oh, wait, that's happening right now. As a result of a nexus of political action, specifically a tariff, and a land hurricane, we now have many of the, much of the grain harvest underwater and spoiling. Finally, we could have an ice-free Arctic. In 2016, plus or minus three, three years, that was projection by Maslowski and colleagues in a paper in the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And I look at the ice level currently in the Arctic, and this is from April 10th of this year. So 2019 looks like it's pretty ugly so far. But I talked to Dr. Maslowski a couple of days ago in person, and he said that their projection is probably wrong, that he doesn't think we will have an ice-free Arctic this year. Hallelujah. So one out of the seven means by which we could lose habitat for our favorite species apparently is not going to happen this year, which is great news for anybody who cares about human life on Earth. Did he say when it was happen? No, I asked him that question about 35 times, and he managed to dodge it every time. And, and he did indicate that because of this projection, and it's a linear projection based on existing data through 2007, because of this projection, he's caught a lot of heat because it hasn't happened yet. 
So he's reluctant to make any sort of projections or predictions in the near future. He does say that their current technology is unbelievable compared to 2012, as you would expect. And so they're on the verge of being better at predicting the outcome. We'll see. Global average temperature rise from a loss of Arctic ice could be very, very profoundly high in a short period of time. I, I've just looked at three of the main means by which we could increase temperature, taking us to just over at least five and a half degrees Celsius. And we'll return to that thought in a minute. Could be that the El Nino currently on, underway, technically the El Nino Southern Oscillation, increases temperature enough that we get beyond the point at which humans can inhabit the planet. We could be we lose all habitat. And you can see what happens during an El Nino event. The ocean acts like a battery, stores a lot of heat, stores a lot of carbon dioxide. During El Nino Southern Oscillation, that heat is released and our temperature, our, our thermometers pick it up and the, and the CO2 is released as well. And so it could be that we have another spike like we did in 15, 16 and going back to 97, 98. And I'd say that's pretty likely, but we don't know yet whether that would be sufficient to take us beyond the pale, beyond the point at which humans can inhabit the planet anywhere. So that's a great unknown at this point. But here's, here's the primary seven bullets we need to dodge indefinitely if we are to maintain habitat for humans on the planet. So obviously it's just a matter of time before overheating or decreased industrial activity gets us. It's just a matter of time before one of these things happens. And I don't know when that is, but I'm surprised we're having this conversation today. Yes. Because I'm stunned not one of these things has happened so far. Summer ice free. So that's what the president of Finland in a joint press conference with President Trump on August 28, 2017 said with respect to the Arctic ice, if we lose the Arctic, we lose the globe. That is reality. And I suspect he was talking about habitat for humans on planet Earth when he said we lose the Arctic ice. How soon would it play out? We don't know. We haven't had an ice-free Arctic for more than three million years, and we've only been on the planet for just over 300,000 years. So we don't know how this plays out, but there will be exacerbation of the self-reinforcing feedback loops that already ha are dominating the Arctic. This gets us to the topic of exponential change, and most of us are, because we're humans, and because of the way we live, and we have relatively short lives, we don't really fully understand the exponential function. So I'm going to give an example here of what happens with the exponential function. Everybody knows about playing with dominoes, but what you may not know is that a domino can knock over another domino, which is about one and a half times larger. So what I have here is a chain of dominoes. Each one is one and a half times larger than the previous one. And the smallest domino is about five millimeters high and one millimeter thick. And I will carefully place it. And there are 13 dominoes. And the largest domino, it weighs about 100 pounds and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. That was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building. Wow. So the exponential function is not something we live with every day. We survive because we use the recent past to predict the near future. Every time we go to the grocery store, we're assuming they're gonna have the same kinds of things we had last time they went there. So here's an exponential function scenario for you. Say last week you went to the grocery store and you picked up a loaf of bread. You went to the bread aisle and it's like half an aisle, 
right? So there's maybe 25 aisles in the grocery store and half of an aisle has bread in it. That's it. You know where it is, it's the bread aisle. It's the same place all the time. Imagine we have a doubling time of a week. So this week you go to the grocery store and the bread aisle is the whole aisle. And you don't think much about it. You hardly even notice. You dip in and out of the bread aisle. Then you go next week and it's two aisles. And four weeks later, they're opening a store next door for all the bread they have at your local store, plus the extra bread that's spilling over into the other, and that's all they got. No more toothpaste for you. It's just bread. And as we know, man cannot live on bread alone. Occasionally, there must be a beverage. I ask you to keep in mind that at least, five, at least 5.6 degree global average temperature rise resulting from an ice-free Arctic shortly after that ice-free Arctic occurs. A paper published on November 13, 2018, written by Strona and Bradshaw, two biologists, describes co-extinctions. And here I'm seeing for the second time in my life the word annihilate in the title of a peer-reviewed journal article. How hard is it to get a peer-reviewed journal article? Virtually impossible. Tell that. Okay. So this was my life from the time I was in graduate school in 19, January of 1983 until next month when I have a paper in Clinical Psychology Forum. And not once have I had a paper that was accepted when I submitted it. Most of the time, the papers are rejected either outright, take this paper away and never show your face again. Or you can resubmit it, it's rejected right now, but you can resubmit it when you make this laundry list of changes suggested by the peer-reviewed peers. So you submit a paper and the editor who you know their name, because you're writing them and sending them the paper. The editor looks over, finds three of his colleagues who are experts in this field, and he sends it to them, and he doesn't tell you who they are. So the writer of the paper has no idea who's reviewing this thing. And it might be people who are just professionally jealous or otherwise hate you. So say I submit a paper. I send it to the journal Ecology, the editor of Ecology sends it out to three of my peers, and because I'm not a very likable guy, two of those three people hate me for various reasons. There's a long list. If you go on the web, you can find all kinds of terrible things I've apparently done. And so he sends it out, and he asks that they return their review within two weeks. A colleague of mine, I once saw the, the articles that he had agreed to review and they were sitting on a table in his office and there were 50 or so of them and some of them were two years old. You don't get paid for this. You don't get paid to write the paper. You don't get paid to review the paper. So of course I'm an agreeable guy. So the editor contacts me and he says Peter Melton submitted this paper to the journal the, the Journal of Irreproducible Results, we'll say, and would you please review it? And I say, yeah, I know Peter Melton, so I'll review his work. And I start looking at it, and oh, I got a class to teach, and then the students are coming in, it's my office hours, the next thing you know, six weeks are gone by, and I'm not, I, don't, I don't know him that well. It's like, he's not my, the highest priority in my life. You know, I got women. And students, I mean students, I have students. I have all kinds of important things in my life. So that just slips away and the editor finally realizes I'm not gonna review it, so he sends it to other people and they like Peter just fine, but they got lives too. And so finally he gets a review, it's a year after the paper was submitted to him. And all you have to do, Peter Melton, with this paper is make these 3,000 changes, some of them minor, some of them not. For one thing, you have to collect a year's worth of data, an additional year's worth of data, because you only got three years of data collection in there. So back to the field, buddy. 
and send us the paper when you've addressed all these concerns. The publication rate relative to the submission rate in high-ranked high peer-reviewed journals is less than 10%. It's very difficult to get papers published. I've, I did this for my entire adult life, and it was one of the least fun, it still remains one of the least fun things I've ever done. Yeah, that's really important because when you list up here something that's peer-reviewed, that thing is several years old usually, and it was a miracle that it got there. And so when they say something like annihilate in a peer-reviewed uh, paper, that's why you see the reaction that he has. Like, oh my God, that made it through? Right. This is a big, big deal to even get a pub paper published. I've had dozens of papers published. Some of my colleagues have had in the low hundreds. Most people, though, get a few papers published. That's it. Uh, while you're on that, can you compare the IPCC? Because I think it's important for them to know how hard it is for that to get through. Yeah, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the United Nations body, relies, it, it starts the process, it creates these groups, scientific groups, and the day they start is the cutoff date for publications. The only evidence they're allowed to, so say for example, the latest group groups are established, they're called working groups, and they're comprised of 20 or so scientists, 20 plus or minus five for the most part. So you get 20 scientists in the room, and they're all experts on some aspect that the next synthetic review is gonna focus on. And say so we start that process today. We accept no peer-reviewed journal articles from here forward. So we only go until April 20th, 2019. That information that was published on April 20th, 2019 is seven years old already. And we begin the working group process today. It takes us three years to get done. We make our recommendations. The politicians strip out all the really ugly looking stuff that might scare people. So it takes five to seven years for an assessment to get done five to seven years for an assessment to get done, and the information that's allowed is at least five years old when you start. That's why the IPCC is one of the most conservative bodies in the history of science on Earth. The paper coinciding with the release of this paper in the peer-reviewed journal says, climate change may cause mass extinctions, well, duh because that's what has driven most of them in the past. And the subtitle is, New Research Found that Extreme Climate Change Risks an Extinction Effect that Could Annihilate All Life on Earth. And by extreme environmental change, they're referring to five or six degrees global average temperature rise, five or six degrees. And I pointed out that an ice-free Arctic would be responsible for at least 5.6 degrees Celsius global average temperature rise. So I suspect the first ice pre-Arctic will lead to the loss of all life on Earth. Not that day, not even that year, maybe not even within five years. There's a, there's a species of microbe that exists only seven miles below the surface of the Earth. Seven miles down. We are not gonna be able to kill it in a week or a year, or probably even a decade. Maybe not ever. To demonstrate the cognitive dissidence of scientists with regard to life on Earth, this paper by Strona and Bradshaw includes a few lines indicating that they really can't believe what their outcome indicates. They really can't believe that this could cause the loss of all life on Earth. So it might not. <laughs> Very scientific. <laughs> really? It's a, I never thought I would see annihilate in the title of a peer-reviewed journal, and I never thought I would see scientists backtracking because they don't personally believe that this, something horrible like this could actually happen right there in the journal. That's, it's, the whole thing is just staggering to me. Maybe I'm easily staggered. This is an important point from the senior author of the paper. 
Our paper demonstrates that even the most tolerant species, and you can consider us tolerant because we can survive in the International Space Station and the nuclear submarines and at McMurdo Station in Antarctica and the Sahara Desert and all these places. So you could argue that humans are a very tolerant species, but even the most tolerant species ultimately succumb to extinction when the less tolerant species on which they depend disappear. We depend upon a lot of different species for our own survival. We don't necessarily admit it, but we are not pollinating our own plants. We're not out there with Q-tips. Gotta yeah, pollinate this one. Jeez. Am I almost done? Yeah, another two hours today. We are not filter feeding our own water. We don't do that. That's a bunch of little things. People ask me all the time, yeah, but it's just the little things that are going to go extinct first, right? Yeah, the little things that really matter. Anybody clean their windshield lately? The bugs are disappearing. The bugs are what matter. We depend greatly upon these other species, these less tolerant species that are disappearing at the rate of 200 species every single day. I don't think it's time for the music to come up. This is not that part of the show. So, so yes, we can go extinct. We are part of all life on Earth. Some people are more alive than others, obviously. Oh, I have so much more. I'm going to stop right there. I'm just going to stop. Is that okay if I just stop? That would be great. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. I welcome your request. I'm going to start there in the back. The guy's had his hand raised since I first started the talk. <laughs> first, in terms of the potential for geoengineering, accepting your statement that current geoengineering techniques cannot solve our uh, problems is partly an invitation to invent other, geo, other engineering techniques, whether it be geoengineering or biological engineering. And I think we should start with looking at biology. For example, the camel. The camel hey, um, okay, before, sir, I know what you're saying is good, but in order to have make this most effective for the next 15 minutes, ask a question, yeah. and then let the doctor share his insight, and there's later time out to tell people about what yeah. they up to. Thank you. So, a few questions. Since the camel does not sweat, but engages in its temperature control by altering its physiology so it can handle a 14 degree per day, I believe it's probably Fahrenheit, 14 uh, Fahrenheit degree per day, uh, every day, there are mechanisms there that can perhaps be emulated. So I wanted to comment on that. And second, my reason for doubting the all life doesn't help the mere human species, but there are many extremophile species that can survive these situations. And more importantly, bacterial spores are capable of living up. We've so far Help me out here, sir. Don't, don't make me seem like the mean guy who to tell you. Ask a question and... My question is, not, do you claim, or do others more pessimistically claim, that these conditions, even though star conditions, would annihilate bacterial spores, which, if they survive, can provide a new bound for evolution. I believe, based on the evidence, that it will take at least 10 million years to recover from this mass extinction event. Will, it in, will there be life on Earth? Well, in addition to the extreme environmental change that we already face, there's the wild card I haven't mentioned because I'm such an optimist. <laughs> but I'm going to drag it out now. You made me, buddy. So obviously when industrial civilization fails, people aren't going to go to their jobs. Money is worthless. They're going to spend time with their families. Even first responders stop responding after a few days and they go home to be with their families. So who's going to manage the 450-some nuclear power plants? I suspect they're going to melt down catastrophically in an uncontrolled manner. All or most of them. 
There's a paper out within the last three days indicating that 90% of the nuclear power plants in the United States are not ready for climate change. And that assumes the 2100 canard about climate change and when it becomes disastrous. So if that's the case, then we're going to have a lot of ionizing radiation stripping away the atmosphere, leaving Earth look a lot like Mars instead of like Venus. And I don't wish for this, and I think it's possible, and I don't know how likely, but I think it's possible that we could lose all life on Earth as a result of extreme environmental change, including that five or six degrees Celsius global average temperature rise. I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows, because we've never been here before which is the quote I had from Homer at the very beginning of, this, of the presentation. You will never be here again. Homer, in the previous paragraph, described that the gods envy us. And that's why he wrote that paragraph that I had up there. You will never be here again. You, are never, you will never be more beautiful than you are today. Any moment might be your last. So, I don't know with great accuracy what the future holds. I am certain that our species, like every other species in the history of the planet, will go extinct. I don't know that the day the last person dies, surrounded by the bodies of like-minded sociopaths in a bunker when the peaches run out. I don't know when that happens, but I sure as hell hope it's not me. And I once had that bunker, by the way. And when I learned about the aerosol masking effect, and when I realized the potential for nuclear Armageddon, and not in the kind of dropping the bombs, I realized that now I can stop leading by example, the example that essentially nobody followed. Now I can focus on teaching instead of shitting in a bucket Instead of making these profound sacrifices that nobody else on the planet was willing to make, I can go back to doing what I do well and what I love, and that's teaching. So that's what I'm doing now. All the way in the back. Uh, you were talking about the ice-free Arctic in the summer. Could you please? Um, I've heard and read in different articles about the methane ice just a few hundred feet below the surface level. And we're starting to see changes in ocean current. And some of those warmer ocean temperatures are making their way into the um, Arctic Circle. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit, about uh, the temperature degree change and what it's going to take and the ice-free summers of the methane release? I'm stunned that we haven't had a 50 gigaton burst yet. Shikova and colleagues didn't say that we needed to have an ice-free Arctic for that methane release. They said it was highly possible for abrupt release at any time. And that was in 2008, 10 and a half years ago. And their work has subsequently been validated, not only by their own field research, but also by another research team, Sarav and colleagues, that I showed earlier. The Arctic Ocean is now warming mostly from below as the Atlantic Ocean is pouring up underneath the Arctic ice. And so we're, we're, we're seeing a whole bunch of species that have never been seen in the Arctic before that are being carried up there in the warm Atlantic waters. So there's a bunch of species that have been identified in the Arctic Ocean which has never been there before. So it's not just the heating that occurs in the summertime with direct sunlight striking above the Arctic Ocean for a few months, but also from the warm Atlantic and probably Pacific waters as well, pouring in from below. So when does that produce an ice-free Arctic? As I indicated, I'm shocked it hasn't happened already. And that's one of the reasons why I live with gratitude every single day and try to live fully. Because every moment might be your last. We don't need an ice-free Arctic for that 50 gigaton burst of methane, that first 50 gigaton burst of methane. It will be followed by others. And that's one of 
more than a handful of events that could take us beyond the point of habitat for humans. So there's a lot of the science that we still don't understand fully. You, you know, we've never experienced an ice-free Arctic. So if it happens for a week this year or next year, and then for a little bit longer the following year and a little bit longer the following year, which one of those produces a massive methane burst? We don't know. Which one of those causes the albedo to decline low enough that we never get ice covering the Arctic again ever, as indicated by the Pliocene paper, which came out December 26th of last year. So there's a lot of unknowns. You can take those however you want. You can take those like, nobody really knows the temperature at which humans will be unable to survive. And that's true. Global average temperature, we're, we're at the highest temperature experienced by humans on the planet now. We're closer to two than we are to one and a half. At what point do we run out of habitat at the planetary level? I don't know, and nobody else does either. But the rate of change is what matters, and we are stomping on the gas pedal as we approach the brick wall. And Stepping off the gas pedal means we hit the wall faster. So how inconvenient is that? <laughs> the rate of species loss, you said, is, is 200 species per, per day? Or? That's right. There's a paper... Yes, the United Nations produced a synthetic paper in August of 2010 estimating 150 to 200 species a day were being driven to extinction. And I interviewed somebody on my radio show probably four months ago who said he did the math and it's more than 200 at this point, more than 200 species a day. And I think he said 213 or 230, something like that. But that seems about right because August 2010 was quite a long time ago and we've done nothing except exacerbate the situation since then. So I don't think we can know with certainty these are estimates based on co-extinctions. So we know that there's a bunch of species that depend upon other species, but we can't keep track of them all. We don't, have a, we don't even have a complete accounting of all the species on Earth. We probably know less than 10% of the species that exist right now. So these are estimates and they all point to a very dire future. Right, and when he says species, though, that's not animals with eyes looking forward species, right? Right. It's, you're talking plants and insects and tiny little microbes. Right. There's, there's far more species of plants than there are of animals. There's far more species of little things, microbes, bacteria, fungi, etc., than there are plants. Yeah. But they all matter because of this process of co-extinctions. They all are part of the web of life. Yeah. Dear Professor, and many people here probably, like myself, enjoy NPR, uh, KZU, and there was a fascinating little bit piece. A Canadian scientist woman was interviewed in Ontario that they're working on some newly manufactured digestive ingredient to give cows to control the methane. All right, we're saved. <laughs> Industrial agriculture accounts for about 30% of the methane released yeah. from Earth. So if we, if we could just get those cows to stop farting, that's still, we still got to account for 70%, which comes from other sources. So that, that would require, by the way, that nobody eats beef from now on. <laughs> and no matter, you know, I've been hearing since I was seven, that if we all just come together, if we start right now and we all come together, we can fix whatever this is that needs fixing. I'm 59 years old. Some of you might even be older than me, as stunning as that is for me. And so you've probably been hearing for longer than I have that if we just start right now, we can solve anything. When are we going to start? We didn't start right now. 
when I was seven or when I was 17 or when I was 27 or when I was 37. There's a lot of times we could have reduced the environmental damage a lot had we taken profound action. But we didn't. We, we can microanalyze every single one of those mistakes we made as individuals and collectively, and it still is not going to turn back the clock. So, my recommendation is to live fully today instead of wishing for a different past because that's grief. Right here in the back, you have your hand up? And then, and then you, yeah. You know, as I see a lot of young people around me, they seem to be hopeless, and that's disabling. disabling. And hopelessness is even more disabling. I appreciate what you're saying, what you're doing, and the information that you're presenting. But, and, and I also have a problem with the peer review process, as you described at 12 years old, information, getting people to do it, who are these people, and, and where does the science really lie, certainly not in the government. You know, who's, who's got the bottom line on this? But what I'm wondering, you know, assuming that maybe the science, even the science that you're using is not complete, and assuming that maybe there's a chance of survival, is there anyone out there seriously considering a way of flipping the paradigm, you know, Buckminster, don't fight the current paradigm, change the model? Is anyone out there doing that? A lot of people are proposing that we terminate industrial civilization. And they've been proposing that for a long time. Any realistic proposals are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you're going the realism route. Huh? Let's move to another planet, she said. <laughs> No, I, no, we're staying on the question, don't worry. None that I know about. Really? You know, we have Elon Musk wanting to go to Mars, and what's, who's the Washington Post guy? Bezos. Bezos, who says we're going to go to the moon, and I wish them luck and good riddance. <laughs> but I don't think they're serious. How could they be serious about that? We can't even take care of planet Earth. You think we're going to terraform Mars? We've been terraforming Earth for a long time. Look where it got us. So I, I haven't seen any realistic proposals going forward. I see Peter Wadhams talking about spewing ocean water into the air on behalf of his grandchildren to, to create what's called the marine cloud brightening to make sure that the incoming sunlight into the Arctic is reduced. But I don't see anybody with a billion dollars pursuing any of that. I see people with a billion dollars throwing that money at Notre Dame, and I'm not saying anything bad about Notre Dame. I love our, the, the culture that we have created on this planet is astonishing. And it's gonna cost a billion dollars for the wood. Because we've destroyed the forests to such a great extent.